Welcome everyone to the BRIM MICA webinar series. And today we are asking the question, is there a path to decarbonization in mining? So we're just gonna take a little bit of time here just to let all the participants join us here from all over the world. And thank you for coming in. Some of you in the wee hours of the morning. But before we start, we wanna do an land acknowledgement because although we're coming in from different parts of the world, our feet are touching the ground um, here at the University of British Columbia in the city of Vancouver, where we are situated on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. So we're really grateful for their stewardship of this land as we deliver this event for the Bradshaw Research Institute of Minerals and Mining, also known as BRIM, in partnership with the Mining Innovation Commercialization Accelerator, the MICA Network. Our webinar host today is John Steen, the director of the Bradshaw Research Institute. So welcome, John. Thank you very much, Janice, for that great introduction and uh, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. Um, our really big challenge that we're facing, I think one of the great challenges in mining at the moment is we know that we have to deliver all these metals. You know, in some instances, it's 10 times what we produce today but we have to deliver these metals in a way that with a reduced carbon footprint. Um, and we're making uh, many uh, companies in the industry are making commitments to net zero uh, to align with Paris targets. So this is a monumental challenge and this is the face, this is what we're facing today. So just to start things off and uh, get you warmed up, we might start out with a poll. Um, Janice, if you could release that poll, please. All righty, here we go. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just make a, a, a few comments while we uh, while you fill out that poll. But one of the things that we believe as a group here is that there's no single silver bullet to net zero. Um, some things are going to be easy to do, some things are going to be very hard to do. And we have a range of speakers from different perspectives, uh, some from uh, emerging technology sectors, uh, some from more of the uh, established mining company areas, from research, from industry. And we hope to bring you today a uh, snapshot of different sectors and hopefully answer that question, is there actually a path to get to net zero? Uh, and we'll have um, a, a series of speakers with 10 minutes each, and then we'll conclude with a, a panel session and some question and answers. And Charles just said he can't vote, he wants to vote. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll, I'll just give you a couple more seconds to answer those, uh, uh, to put your entry into that uh, poll. And um, we might take a look at that, Janice, in a, in a second. Well, let's, let's have a look. What have we got? So it's a range of different options here. It's quite sp spread out. Integration of and utilisation of renewables. Electrification, that's a very big topic. We have a big electrification um, uh, conference going on at the moment in Arizona. Um, but also things that we don't normally think about, such as all body knowledge and exploration. Um, that's definitely an area we would like to uh, have a look at today. Carbon capture, all of these things are going to play a role. And I think your diversity of the answers really reflects the, the multifaceted uh, technological challenge that we're looking at with decarbonisation. Thank you, Janice. We might close that poll. So to begin with, I might get uh, Dr. Ali Madize to set the scene for us. Uh, Ali Madize is the Canada Research Chair in Advanced Mine Energy Systems and also an Assistant Professor at the Norman B. Keevil Mining Engineering Department at the University of British Columbia. He's currently the Chair of the Underground Mining Society for the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum and a board member of the Canadian Association of Energy Economics. I'll also say that Ali is uh, BRIM's uh, theme leader in sustainable mine energy systems, and he does a great job and he brings a lot of energy to that. Um, very, he's a very, very busy guy. Uh, his research focuses on energy systems used in mining and petroleum industries, including the development of novel solutions for improving energy efficiency, decarbonisation, and replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy. So. Not a small scope, but this is uh, not a not a narrow problem that we're looking at. So, Ali, I'll hand it over to you for a, for a ten minute presentation just to set the scene for us. Thank you. Thank you, John, and hello, everyone. Uh, 
I will go ahead and share my screen. I believe everybody can see my screen now. So uh, yeah, we will have an overview of uh, what BRIM is focusing on in terms of the, and decarbonization. But for my own part, I will uh, mostly focus on the mine energy decarbonization, which is actually the focus of my research. Uh, I am uh, preaching the converted already, but uh, let's look at the scope of the things and the challenges mining is facing. This is a very old data and it, the, the source is U.S. Department of Energy, but it is still very relevant. So you could see here on the X and Y axis uh, mining and um, mostly um, other natural resource based industries are amongst the most energy intensive industries. That, is, that means that uh, to contribute $1 to our economy, they are uh, consuming a lot of energy. So intensity is there, but also because of their scale, their overall energy consumption is very high. That's one thing that is uh, basically, um, my, I myself have learned by involvement uh, through the different projects that I've done with the industry. I, I used to teach to my students that between 15 and 25% of the production cost is energy and it's raising. I was really Ali. happy when I read it. Hi, Ali. I just want to check. Um, people can't see your slides. Do you want to uh, okay. try sharing again? Thanks. I'm sorry for that. There we go. Done. Yeah, this is this is the uh, this is the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Energy slide uh, graph. But uh, let's look at this example that. Uh, uh, I, I took this photo when I was visiting this mine in Northwestern Territories. This is a um, diamond mine, and they installed this fact sheet everywhere, including the kitchen, the washroom, everywhere on the camp, to just draw people's attention to energy intensity. This is the fiscal year of 2016, but you could see in bold letters they're mentioning that the operating cost, uh, sorry, the energy share of the operating cost is more or less 20%, which is within that range. But also they are mentioning that one third or 33 percent of the Northwestern Territories basically uh, emissions is coming from this mine. And I would guess the rest of it comes from other mines because they're not, there's not a huge uh, industrial activity there. But uh, and they are telling you that they're using this single mine is using 75 million liters of diesel, which is a lot. And they're telling you where they're using that. 44% in fleet, 43 for power generation, 12% for heating. This is an underground mine, so they need a lot of heat uh, for intake air heating. And also, more or less, it's three times more expensive to generate electricity on mine site as compared to the closest city, which in this case is Edmonton. But having that in mind, in our own um, re uh, research, we look at this mine as an energy system, and we look at it based on this kind of uh, representation of energy system, this it, it, everything is sourced from diesel, either generation of electricity, heating with boilers, or uh, powering the fleet, motive power, basically. So that's one challenge. The other challenges that have been most recently uh, kind of raising is the environmental footprint, mostly emissions and pollution. So carbon taxation is coming. That's why for many mining uh, companies, it has become an existential question. Do we want to decarbonize or not? And basically, the government of Canada has put forward a, a plan in that by 2030, most mining companies are pledging to uh, 30 to 40% reduction because the carbon taxation would be $170 per ton and also net zero by 2050 mostly. When we talk about decarbonization, most people think you're talking about electrification, which is an important piece. And uh, believe me, there's a lot of activities within BRIM and sustainable mine energy systems, and also my own research at Advanced Mine Energy Systems uh, Group uh, here at UBC that we focus on electrification through either battery electric vehicles or hydrogen fleet or rope cons or conveyance, which I have on the screen right now. But Going back to that um, example from Northwest Territories, you could see that in that case, even if you fully electrify your fleet, so 100% electrification, you're still sourcing that electricity from diesel. So in, in this case and many similar cases, 100% electrification does not lead to decarbonization necessarily. So they're not synonymous. So the reason for that is mining is actually a very, very large set of activities and industry is very diverse. So you are, you're, you're 
hard rock mine is not the same as a kind of a coal mine or potash mine. An underground mine is not necessarily the same as a, a, a surface mine. And climatic conditions, how intensive your comminution and mineral processing basically um, uh, um, it, it would, would change the energy portfolio, they will all make uh, a lot of difference. And also your grid access, are you sitting on a grid that has uh, access to a kind of a clean carbon free electricity or you're sitting on a on a grid that is very gray, it's using like coal or um, some other source of fossil fuels for electricity or uh, are you totally removed and you have to use some sort of other um, diesel or other source of uh, um, renewable energy? So also, uh, in order to achieve decarbonization at a higher level, you need to have hybridized and also integrated solutions. That makes it really complex. And you would have basically to look at electrification and digitalization at the same time. So you will not be able to go through this bar barrier and break this barrier if you're using the old technology, if you're still using the uh, 50 years ago technologies. Um, in For this uh, presentation and due to the limited amount of time that we are allowed, I will only focus on three examples just to draw your attention to some uh, live examples from our own uh, SME portfolio, sustainable energy uh, portfolio. And that uh, with that, I will focus on thermal solutions and also electrification through continuous mining and uh, use of microwave and also mine energy digital twin. So in this case, the, you would look at these different hybrid and integrated solutions that would have different focus areas. And with digital twin, we, we try to bring everything together. So an example of that, this is a uh, something that uh, was a CFI research and it's still growing legs. So most recently, for example, we've been um, uh, partnering up with NRCAN and we're trying to integrate that into a part of the decarbonization of intake air heating systems. But let me tell you what it is very briefly. In underground mines, you have an, an intake shaft and an exhaust shaft. And usually, unfortunately, they're very far away. But this, this is the idea of how about designing them to be situated closer to each other so you can take advantage of exhausted recovery. This is not a technology that belongs to mining. It is actually very mature in HVAC systems and some mines in the world have, have looked at it. But in, in here, what is novel about this, we're looking at um, direct contact heat exchange. So you're showering the exhaust and recovering the, the heat from the exhaust by use of water and then delivering that into an indirect heat exchanger here. So in this case, for example, you could be in a very cold climate. The exhaust could be at 14 degrees centigrade, but the intake could be at minus 20 or minus 30. So you get uh, not 100%, but a good portion of your natural gas that you would have used in intake air heating replaced by this exhaust heat recovery. And this is a fully automated system. It is in UBC and we are trying, as I said, uh, to take it to the next stage and use it for intake air, um, uh, basically heating um, conceptual and later on uh, lab scale experimentations. Another idea that my, my research team and partners have been working on recovery of diesel generators at mine site for the same purpose, exhaust heat recovery for intake air heating. So by intake air heating in that Northwestern Territories kind of uh, example, it was 12% of the overall energy portfolio, which is almost 9 million liters per year. And, and also we looked at a rock pile thermal storage system, which is basically using uh, excess power from wind turbines to be uh, stored in, in thermal storage in a rock pile. Another example of uh, decarbonization uh, is microwave drying. This is an example from tech. They're using 26,000 tons uh, of basic CO2. They're emitting that much for natural gas uh, heating in their dryers for this type of material as received in our labs. We, do, we did microwave drying tests and we, uh, we're happy to see that they're very amenable to microwave. So in this case, you would use electricity and microwave has selective heating. You save even energy, not only carbon, but also the total energy amount would be saved. We're also partnering up with McGill University on a very uh, like a large scale research project on comminution and also cutting of rocks, uh, microwave assisted breakage of rocks, should I say. So we are looking at um, large scale systems. This is a slab. It's almost uh, the size of a like a tunnel. Uh, sorry, 
tile. And you could see we're doing advanced modeling to see where the, the cracks happen and how we can take advantage of that in rock cutting. And also in comminution, how can you take advantage of that in the mineral processing and fragmentation of rocks? So coming back to the overall um, miners digital twin, it, it, like I said, a mining system is very complex and, and looking at different scenarios, for example, is your energy, uh, energy uh, used in your mineral and uh, mineral comminution uh, system minimal or intensive, or do you have fuel cells or batteries for, for electro, uh, electrochemical storage or both? Or do you, is your fleet powered with hydrogen or battery? It will make all these differences. And then you have to basically map them and look at the different costs, basically NPCs or NPVs, whatever you're interested in, and then make decisions. So to conclude within the 10 minutes that we have, I should say decarbonization is an all front effort. It's not a, a, a over a night, it's step by step. And it's not a one size fits all. And there's no, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. Um, electrification is very important, but it's not the only piece of the puzzle. And there are lower, lower hanging fruits. By that, I mean the technology is more mature, right? So decarbonization of electricity and decarbonization, by decarbonization of electricity, I mean use of renewables at mine sites or somewhere in the grid or decarbonization of thermal power, basically waste heat recovery, thermal storage or microwave drying as examples are very good examples of those uh, low hanging fruits. And in, within the, in, in that, in, in the meantime, when different technologies are being developed and, and getting mature, mining companies need to have a short term and long term plan and then look at how they can take advantage of these within the financial uh, lim uh, constraints that they have. So what is the marginal abatement cost? What is the technology readiness level and risk factors for use of different technologies? And Whatever we do, no matter what we do, there is a portion of our emissions that will be very hard to abate. And for that, we need to look at carbon sequestration and carbon offsets. There is a very strong research team within BREM that we are looking at, for example, mineralization of carbon into tailings. And it's led by a colleague of mine, Professor Greg Dippel from uh, the, the geological department. But it's it's a very large uh, uh, research and I'm part of that as well. So with that, I would... Uh, uh, I would pass it back to John, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them either in the chat or later on while we have the panel. John? Thank you, Ali. And we already have a question for you in the chat. So the very good question about can you start to decarbonize uh, from the early stages of mine design? So that's a good question for you, I think. Thank you, Ali. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, our sp second speaker, Oscar Malpica. Um, Oscar is an innovation and R&D management professional with 20 years of experience developing technologies. He leads multidisciplinary teams that are focused on developing social and technological solutions to counter climate change and foster a carbon neutral future. These, it, these innovations are delivered across several industries, including IT, manufacturing, sustainability, government and non-government organisations and technology startups, including the mine industry. But uh, in, this, in this role that he comes to you today um, as the executive director of Rockburst Technologies, which is a spin-off in, of envisioning, envisaging labs, Oscar and his team are dedicated to the development and commercialization of the next generation of mining comminution technologies using supercritical CO2 rock pulverization methods. So Oscar, welcome, over to you. Thanks, John. Um... Can you guys see my screen right now? Yes, we can, thank you. Let's just confirm that. And to answer the question, is there a path to decarbonization? Let's not keep you know, the audience waiting for the answer. The answer is yes. Is there a will? That's what we're gonna be discussing in the panel. Um, thanks for the intro. So at Rockburst Technologies, um, we are focusing on communication. And uh, communication, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's a process that consumes three to four percent of the global electricity per year. Roughly, what Germany consumes in one year is what just this one process consumes. And just to give you uh, a sense of, you know, the extent of the energy consumption in this just one process, Australia consumes seventeen percent of its electricity just breaking rocks. 
Canada is around 14 to 17 percent. So, you know, a big chunk of our energy goes into just breaking rocks, period. Massive problem. So uh, we do break rock, but we break it in a different way. Instead of using mechanical means of smashing rocks together like cavemen have done since the beginning of times, and we continue doing so, despite the fact that we know that that requires a lot of energy, we do it in a different way. Instead of breaking the rocks, applying external forces, we, we promote tensile stress and we break rock from within. And so we use CO2 to do this. Uh, these are some of the organizations that have supported our, our technology. This is still a technology under development, um, but you know, we continue to do so. Uh, we call this transcritical CO2 pulverization. That's a mouthful or TCO2 for short. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this. You know, I guess you know, we're all very familiar with uh with uh, the comminution problem and the energy, you know, obviously. We need more critical minerals. There is going to be more demand for um, for mining more, and therefore energy will energy consumption will just spike. On top of that, the uh, grade that we're getting from ores is just decreasing. More material, less minerals, not good. Energy will spike. So. Again, you know, we're a gas-based comminution, and basically we make use or try to really promote tensile stress. And why is this important? Because rocks are 10 times weaker on their tension than they are on their compression. So right off the bat, you know, we take advantage of that fact, right? So less energy. That's, that's definitely a good thing. Number two, because we use gas, we get rid of all comminution media. So right now, the way rock is broken, essentially hasn't changed in oh God, you know, hundreds of years. Right now, the best thing that we have is basically a washing machine with a bunch of steel balls that just tumbles. That's a tumble mill, of course, and I'm being like facetious here. But you know, my point is that, my point is that now this technology hasn't changed in a lot of years. And this is the one process that consumes the, the, the most energy in the whole cycle of mining. Therefore, you have you know, the most energy consumption. Therefore, you have the most GHG emissions. So this is how our process looks like. You know, this, is in a, uh, this is done in a um, prototype at UBC where you end. You know, this is obviously just a prototype. But you can see roughly this is one cycle through our process. So imagine this is the equivalent of a tumble mill going one rotation in a ball mill, say. So we use cycles. We basically put the rock in a chamber, pressurize the chamber. When we get to supercritical CO2, at that moment, the gas goes inside the pores of the rock and then very rapidly depressurize the system, gas tries to expand, breaking the rock from within. That's really, you know, the whole, the whole thing that we do. Obviously, you know, the, the secret sauce of our technology is determining what thermodynamic levers we have to move to get the most literally bang out of our buck and get the right comminution and the right, um, the right uh, breakage. Uh, of the rocks. This is a summary that I kind of want just, you know, to, uh, you know, people to really understand, you know, the, the, what we do. And I will start, you know, with number one, this technology is powered by CO2. Therefore, it's very likely that in the future we could use or we could source that CO2 from air or direct uh, CO2 capture systems uh, in point source capture uh, technologies. This is great because obviously we're using some waste gas or directly from the air to fuel our process. Once this is inside, then we have this kind of numbers. We have already reached up to 90% energy savings compared to incumbent technologies. So that's why mining companies are like, oh, no, I like this. Uh, this is comparable bulk mills, obviously less consumption of energy, translate into less emissions. We do not need grinding media, therefore, ancillary emissions are also reduced. 
And this is a dry process. This is waterless. We don't need water for this. We could use water uh, for optimization, but at the end of the day, this is a waterless process. Therefore, you know, some miners in the Middle East and Australia certainly are looking into, into this process because um, right now the clamor from the mining industry are three points, energy, water, and decarbonization. And if you can hit two out of those three, you're in business, we're hitting three out of three. So uh, certainly we see a lot of potential moving forward. And the last thing that I'm going to mention is carbon sequestration. So a sub-process of our technology is carbon sequestration. Because we use CO2 in a pressurized environment, some of that CO2 gets either mineralized, depending on the ore that we are breaking, or trapped in the interstitial spaces of the waste tailings that the process uh, produces. So you get a really nice uh, technology that is hitting you know, the three major nodes, energy reduction, GHG reduction, and carbon sequestration in one shot. At this moment, again, you know, we have three prototypes uh, with UBC, uh, and we're still studying this technology, but it's very likely that in the next two years, uh, we develop a demonstration plant at one of our partners or client site. You know, we're already working with the big three mining companies and uh, some some governments um, around the world, including the government of South Australia and uh, and Arcan here uh, in home at home. But um, it's quite interesting how these different technologies are now aligning um, in a, in a certain way. Now, let me get back to the decarbonization path uh, uh, question that John. Uh, post to the panel, or will post to the panel. And the problem with this type of technologies, the one I'm presenting here, despite the fact that it has a lot of promise, they're quite expensive. Now, we are basically dealing with massive transformation of matter and energy. This is not optimization, guys. This is a breakthrough innovation. This basically changes the parameters of communication the way we know it now. So this has intensive capital expenditure costs just to get to a demonstration site. And we're talking around $10 million. This is not, again, this is not moving bits and bytes. This is not an IoT plus AI solution. This is a real unit process operation solution that basically flips the equation of communication the way we, the way we know now. Um, so I would just want to say this. Uh, I had had the chance you know, to be around several international forums that every miner is really looking for a solution that hits you know, the right marks. However, whether there's a willing to invest in breakthrough technologies, that's a whole different uh, conversation that we can have you know, uh, in, in, the, um, in the panel. And so I guess because we have very, you know, distinct and diverse uh, uh, crowd here in the audience, I'll be very curious, you know, to understand different perspectives when it comes down to entrepreneurs developing breakthrough technologies and also potential sponsors from organizations that are willing to invest with patient capital into these technologies that will take five to 10 years to redevelop. Now, mind you, five to 10 years of window is way shorter than the 30 years that competing technologies like ball mills or SAG or HPGRs really took to get to a commercialization stage. I'll leave it at that. I'm waiting for the panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Oscar. And I see there's a question for you in the chat. Uh, so a bit of homework there for you. Uh, thank you for that perspective, particularly from the entrepreneur's perspective. Really appreciate that. Um, next speaker I'd like to introduce to you is uh, Chiting Lo. Uh, Chiting is the founder and president of ELO Solutions. Uh, she's a strategist, entrepreneur, and independent director committed to making global net zero carbon future a reality focused on high impact uh, industries. Um, Chiting has been involved in uh, decarbonisation strategy for quite a long time. So this. While the industry is really caught up uh, to this as being a topic, Chi Ting's been working on this for, for, for many years. Uh, Chi Ting believes that ESG innovation and investment are necessary to reach climate targets and that the mining industry is a critical piece of the puzzle. 
She's a professional engineer with 20 years of experience and deep sectoral knowledge and expertise in ESG performance. Uh, and leadership in innovation has gained international recognition. Her approach to work is collaborative, deliberate and authentic, and she consistently applies uh, these approaches to serving clients, organisations, and also as a valued industry advisor to us here at BRIM. So uh, thank you very much, Chi Ting, over to you. Great. Can you see my deck okay? Not yet. Oh, okay, hold on. Um, try again. Good now? Now we're good, thank you. Awesome. Well, we, we already had the uh, link acknowledgement, but I just wanted to also ad address that I, I'm, I too, like at the Brim Institute, I work and play on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Swale of Two uh, First Nations. I'm very grateful for that. We've heard a couple of really good presentations. I want to maybe take a step back uh, for the next 10 minutes. So here's a graph of a typical company emissions pathway to net zero. We said, yes, it is possible. It depends on, are you willing to do that? Ali gave a presentation on, I would say, probably focus on some of these yellow and green boxes here. How do we really minimize um, the way that we emit, that, that we manage our emissions? And also both uh, presenters earlier have touched upon that at some point, you can only reduce so much of your emission, you really need to think about other ways to get to net zero. What I want to address is how mining may be a little bit different. Uh, we like to say that every mine is different and here's a slide that makes us to think we're different, but it is different in a good and a bad way. Um, as we look into having increased amount of critical critical minerals to address the energy transition, unlike at another industry, our business as the usual emission will really increase. And because of the lower uh, or great, more challenging jurisdictions to work in, not having the choice to have any kind of low emission energy supply as we can, and all this, all these challenges in intrinsic to mining as, as, as with where the ore and the mineral is really at, actually probably shows that at the end of the day, not only that our business as usual emission will increase quite a bit more compared to other industries, the hard to abate emissions, the portion that we just can't reduce with conventional mitigation technology and, 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 and uh, processes may also be larger than the other industries. And that's what I want to focus on today is really that hard to abate emission options and what are some of the strategies and how do we think about managing that and, and when do we want to think about managing that? So oftentimes when we look at emissions, we really focus on these two red boxes. We're already operating. How do we reduce and minimize our, our scope one and two emissions? And now uh, with increasing pressure from the, all kinds of uh, stakeholders, whether that's government, uh, investors, and others, how do we now think about the downstream uh, emissions that we have as well and manage that as, as a whole? But what I really want to address here is really simply that the mining life cycle is very long. There are different opportunities for all kinds of companies to make decisions at different stages of the mining life cycle to really help us not only minimize our emission, but also address the hard to bay emissions. Can we consider um, carbon capture and storage in the design phase? Can we uh, think about carbon sequestration as one of the business metrics when we're doing exploration and building up projects. Can we really think about reclama reclamation? I know that we a lot of companies already do progressive reclamation, but are there something more we can do uh, to really help us get started on that reclamation, but also looking into decarbonizing our footprint as a, as a joint activity? Lots of things we can do, not only in the operating phase, um, but the decisions really impacting uh, the future of the operating phase that we could potentially make a different decision on. So normally, and I'm not going to dwell on this, normally when we think about decarbonization, we think about it in, in many different buckets on where 
activities can happen. So whether they are energy efficient opportunity, um, opportunities, whether they're electrification that was uh, mentioned earlier on, whether that is new technology in mineral processing and other way, other ways. At the end of the day, we have some leftover to, to think about. And with the increasing pressure around managing and understanding our scope three emissions, there is probably also going to be a, a bucket of leftover emissions that's hard to abate. So how can we address that to really go to that true net zero? So I have five points to share. I know the, the time is limited, so I'm not, uh, can't get into a lot of detail, but happy to chat about this further. I think the first thing I would really uh, uh, emphasize on is to have a, the right business and ESG uh, objective alignment around hard to obey emissions. Really think about what is material but also ambitious in reaching your business objective. Oscar mentioned earlier that, um, you know, do we have, you know, do we, yes, there's a path forward, but do we have the ability? Are we thinking about making that investment? Well, if we if we're really aligning and knowing what the business is trying to achieve and having authentic and achievable but ambitious ESG goals, some of those decisions should become a bit more natural, or at least there should be a sy systematic way to assess those opportunities. If if there's true alignment with your business and ESG objectives. Second of all, and I'm not saying someone or, or your board should have a deep understanding of, of energy and carbon footprint, but as a collective with the expertise within the organization, integrating ESG into every aspect of your operations, there should be a deep understanding of energy and carbon footprint within the organizations to help inform that strategy and really be um, clear about equitable transition. So mining is a is a really interesting um interesting space because we are operating where the ore is. We don't get to choose where we want to operate. Well, we do a little bit, but we don't really get to choose. Um, so this equitable transition topic is actually something we can make a huge positive impact. So ESG is, is E here we're talking about, but it's very, very related to the social side of things as well. So we have the opportunity to make impacts or having, you know, kill, kill, um, two birds or three birds or five birds with one stone by really having that um, understanding and where we want to go to. Timing is important. It, there are actually different ways to be more cost effective uh, 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 um, when we make those decisions. I don't mean that you should just push everything to 2049 if you have a 2050 net zero target, but really being strategic about when should we be investing or when should we be implementing certain opportunities because whether that's where the technology is at or whether that is just uh, other reasons on may helping you make that decision on, on when to act on certain initiatives. Um, apart, apart from that, you know, we can't do everything on our own. Really be um, thoughtful and intentional around collaboration on where you see that you as a, a company cannot achieve the outcome you want yourself who are your peer groups that can really help you uh, collaborate to de-risk, whether they're new technologies or just finding ways to accelerate things a bit faster? You know, Oscar's technology, as an example, um, it could be something that maybe not one company, but a several mining company could come together to help with, with the uh, commercial uh, pilot plan because um, we all benefit from seeing the output of that. How do we really do better in, in terms of collaboration? Um, and finally, around investment, it, it, it may be interesting to think about how you want to invest your money. So there's that timing, timing component that we just talked about. But there's also a really interesting way to think about what is the best way uh, to use your money to, uh, now and in the future to achieve these ESG uh, and net zero objectives. So those are the things, you know, they, I know that they sound very general. Maybe I'll give you a very quick example on one thing that could be hitting some of these objectives. This could be a mining company that really want, that has, has understood its, its life of mine emissions and in the future, and really want to make an impact on um, um, the, the, the bio space. They understand that uh, it's a strategic area. They may be operating in a place where they are near, near the ocean and they realize that they themselves are not able to actually um, work on a wetland opportunity. But knowing that wetlands are one of the best natural carbon solutions to remove carbon from the air, they may say that, hey, having a blue carbon ecosystem type of strategy for us really hit a lot of different objectives. It helps with the biodiversity. It helps with 
um, our, our goal around carbon reduction. We see really credible partners that we can partner with now. We, we know that there's actually no way to invest at this moment directly as a private company, but we see this opportunity. So let's think about when we may want to implement this in the future, working on ways to collaborate and finding ways to, to make this real. So just a quick example on what we might want to do. There's other examples around, you know, Ali mentioned around um, carbon sequestration using tailing. That's another really good ex example. Biochar is another good example. There are many, many examples is how you make these examples into to your strategic plan and, and making them ambitious, material, uh, timely, and, and, and something that really you can stand by. I'll stop there. Thank you, Chiting. Excellent presentation, bringing things back to uh, the strategy level. Um, I'd like to now turn to uh, Charles Niabezi. Um, Charles is representing uh, the other partner in this webinar. So this part, this um, webinar is co-sponsored by Brim and by uh, Micah. So Charles is Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization for the Center of Excellence in Mining Innovation, SEMI. He currently leads the Commercialization Support Services Division for the Pan-Canadian Mining Innovation Commercialization Accelerator called MICA of which Brim is the uh, West Coast uh, partner in the, in the Pan-Canadian Mining Network. Uh, he supports business and proposal development and uh, securing uh, global partnerships. Charles is passionate about creating long-term value for organisations and clients. He leverages a background in mining engineering, business and relationship building to identify business development opportunities with public and private client segments towards closing the commercialization gap associated with introducing new technologies into the mining stream, mining value stream. Thank you, Charles, and over to you. Okay, excellent. Thank you, uh, John. And uh, also thank you to Ali and Oscar and Chi team for setting a good foundation for this conversation. I'm gonna share my screen and then I can get going. All right, just to confirm, you see my screen? Yes, we do. Thank you, Charles. Perfect. Okay, I think, you know, Oscar started off his presentation by sort of giving a quick answer to the question, is there a pathway to, to decarbonization? And I will say like, you know, the old saying is there are many ways to skin a cat. There are certainly many ways to, many pathways to decarbonization. So and I think the key word is a collaboration. There has to be a, an immense amount of collaboration that needs to happen in order for us to achieve some of the objectives that we are, we are setting for decarbonization. Um, you know, the, the Canada is a is a country that has a lot of uh, innovation that's happening in, in so many different regions across our nation. You know, if you look at Canada, all the way from 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 Brim on the east coast to the College of North Atlantic uh, on the east coast, we've got all these partners. You know, so from west to to east, we've got all these partners that are part of our network. And and the reason for that is we must tap into the innovation ecosystem across Canada in order to find where those innovations are being um, bred that can then have an impact on how we address decarbonization as a, as, as, as a whole. So because of these partners that we have, you know, we, we strongly believe that you know, by tapping into this innovation ecosystem across the country, we'll be able to move things forward in a faster way. And this is the layout of, of this network that we have called the Biker Network, in that it has these partners across the country who all play an integral role in moving things forward. I think uh, Oscar mentioned that uh, you know, we've got energy, we've got water. Um, yeah, but we also realize that the mining industry needs to be productive. It's a business after all, right? So unproductive businesses get out of business pretty fast. So we need to make sure that the industry is productive while it decarbonizes. We, again, energy has been mentioned a couple of more times and uh, you know, we need to obviously ensure that we're using energy the best way possible. And the other piece that's playing a big role in the industry today is the whole digital piece where mining just needs to become smarter, right? And the smarter we get with mining, the more we can control how we do work and the more we're able to then um, obviously achieve some of those goals that we want to achieve on the decarbonization front. And then the environment is obviously very, very important. And we do want to make sure that whatever we're doing is reduced that environmental risk and long-term liabilities that are associated well with mining. I always like to tell, especially non-mining people, 
I like to tell them that mining is more than just a hole in the ground. That when you look at the entire mining value chain, and I think cheating even brought focus to the mining value chain itself, you can see that mining is not just getting stuff out of the ground, right? It's the prospecting piece and exploration, permitting and licensing, you know, you go to financing and construction, you know, extraction itself, movement of the material, the transportation piece is very big. And then, you know, as Oscar was so eloquently put it, uh, processing, breaking down the material through what's called combination to a size where we can extract the valuable or material is an energy intensive process. Then there's like reclamation, cleaning up after ourselves and then, you know, putting it back to how we found it. And then also the repurposing of mining assets. So what I wanted to do is first of all, kind of show you this box to say, hey, mining is more than just one component of it, right? So decarbonization needs to happen across the entire mining value chain. And I think it's so important that we understand that the path of decarbonization is not just fixing one problem in the mining value chain, it's fixing all the little pieces. You know, it's one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one equals 100, right? So what are those plus ones that we need to add together to achieve that 100% that we want to achieve uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a people? So what I have here is just some examples of the types of things we should be thinking about when we're thinking about these different buckets of the mining value chain, you know, and I'll just touch on one example on each of them. So under the prospecting piece, you can see that using remote technologies like satellite satellites and drones is, is good on the decarbonization front and explore, exploration. And I think you're going to hear from uh, some of our team uh, during the panel from IDEON. I think Kim Lawrence is here with us. We'll be talking about using really creative technologies that can allow us to get better results faster without all the work that needs to happen traditionally. And then you've got your permitting and licensing. Again, it's so important. And I think this will come up in the future is that we are we are not going to open new mines without getting the permitting and licensing down, down pad. Then the financing piece is also uh, critical in adopting technologies. Um, driving to extraction, you know, where most of the work is happening, the heavy lifting, electrification. And electrification and hydrogen utilization is, is something that is key. And then again, on the processing side, I mentioned Oscar's technology um, and you know, reclamation, things like bioengineering techniques are important. And then uh, again, the circular economy approaches to mine waste management and rehabilitation of mining assets is, 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 is critical. And even using old mine sites for energy generation is another piece that can help us with the whole decarbonization piece. Um, so accelerating innovation into mining, you know, there's some things that are called key success factors raise awareness, do the demonstration projects, adhere to regulations and standards, you know, do some proof of concepts, do some pilot projects, make sure you are addressing change management and because the industry can be a little bit slow sometimes, and then have a good support system around your innovation and be scale up ready. And uh, again, funding, you know, there are green bonds coming out there that are looking to fund things that are more green, that are more, that are aligned with what we, are, we call decarbonization. And again, you know, commercialization of any innovation doesn't come without challenges. So some of the challenges obviously are make sure that you are, you know, addressing the bottom line, uh, you know, be respective of work stop stoppage while you're implementing new solutions. And, uh, you know, the whole credits and carbon credits conversation is uh, undergoing, under, underway and still needs some refinement. And then there's the global targets to also meet. Uh, the social policy piece is, is important. If you don't respect the people, nothing happens in mining. And then again, people want proven technologies, uh, standardization on the accounting side and the availability of solutions. And then you know, one big thing that's coming in mining today is skilled people. You know, To achieve some of those targets, we need skilled people to work with. So it's gonna be really uh, super important. Uh, this is just an example of the ecosystems of supports that need to be addressed so that we can accelerate decarbonization. So take your favorite technology, who's supporting it. It takes an ecosystem to commercialize decarbonization innovations into the mining industry. So that's something to bear in mind, hence the importance of that whole collaboration piece. Um, here's some Canadian resources that are sensitive to addressing and helping us move decarbonization goals forward. Uh, you know, there's all organizations that have not only funding, but also expertise. So you can see here that there's a couple of uh, organizations that are playing a key role, uh, including things like the Strategic Innovation Fund, uh, the Low Carbon Economy, Economy Fund, and a few more, including the Net Zero Challenge. So you can see from this slide here that there's a few organizations in Canada that are playing a key role in decarbonization. Um, there are also some networks that are out there, including our own network, the MECA Network, 
Uh, there's a couple of management in Canada. Foresight is doing some great work with the Carbon Next. Mars Innovation is launching uh, a mission from Mars on decarbonization. Osea is doing some work in this area. Also, Crin, the Clean Resource Innovation Network. And there's others as well that I have not mentioned here that are also working in the same areas to advance decarbonization uh, technologies and decarbonization mindset into our economy. Here's some examples of some international bodies that are sensitive to things around climate change, decarbonization. And you can see our own association of um, the Canadian Institute of Mining, CIM, PDAC, MAC. They're all doing some great work in this area. And some names to drop here, obviously, are the IPCC, the ICMMs, and the IEAs. I'm just throwing some acronyms at you, but you can see from the screen here what the full names are. Um, and this is my second last slide. Okay, I've got about two minutes left to go. Um, so what I want to talk about here is just give you some more examples of the types of things we should be thinking about when we're talk, thinking about things that matter as tools for innovation. And I'm going to talk to you about in these three buckets, but on one screen. So what you can see here is that on the carbon accounting side, the software that's being developed, emission tracking, and there's many startups coming up actually who are doing things like carbon accounting, startups that are doing carbon credits, and so actually a few startups coming up on the carbon credit side. Um, you know, creating that verified carbon credits marketplace is going to be important. And then we can look at energy mix, you know, renewable integration, energy management and optimization, some of the things that Ali spoke about. And then energy storage is big. In fact, I think, you know, the, 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 the holy grail to decarbonization has to have storage as a primary focus. Different kinds of batteries are coming up. Solid state batteries are coming up. And I have about a minute left to go. Nuclear energy is important with the SMRs. And then transitional fuels are so important. In fact, look at all what you have right now. The fossil fuels are all transitional, but natural gas, hydrogen, uh, again, biomass derived fuels are coming up. Uh, biotechnology is another area of interest. There are so many things happening in the biotechnology side that are so interesting. Bioleaching for mineral extraction. We even have microbial assisted mineral processing uh, and with some awesome projects like the MMAP project that are looking at microbial assisted mineral processing and other things as well. Microbial remediation solutions. All these things are so important. Power remediation technologies are also are online. Uh, to be able to help us to reach those targets. And as I said earlier, you know, the path to decarbonization has so many different paths to it, right? And then the last thing I'll talk about is alternative materials. Things like high-performance sustainable concrete that's carbon infused is important. And again, the last thing I'll say is just recycled and eco-friendly building materials are so important. And that brings me to the end of my part of the presentation. And I'm going to hand it back to John. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And thank you for uh, featuring that ecosystem perspective. That um, it, you know the, the pathway to decarbonisation will involve many actors and many companies. So, thank you for reminding us of that. Um, we we have another poll, so we thought we'd do a poll at the beginning and end of the presentations. Um, and this poll, uh, Janice, would you launch that one, please? There we go. So. Let's start thinking about some of the challenges. What do you think are the biggest obstacles to the mining industry for meeting a net zero 2050 decarbonisation goal? I'll just give you a couple of uh, seconds to answer that. And um, Janice, would you like to give us the answers? See how we go. So, we're looking at short-term thinking and lack of long-term vision, something that the industry has been uh, regularly um, uh, accused of, um, but also insufficient readily available de decarbonisation solutions. Um, um, Ali has a, a, a another slide on the gap um, between currently available technology and the, and the technology needed to reach net, net zero. So there's some really um, important barriers there, cultural change, but the biggest ones there are short-term thinking and the lack of uh, technological solutions at the moment. So maybe we'll just work on some of those ideas and I'd like us to move into a, a panel discussion. But before I do, I'd like to introduce our, our an, a, uh, addition to our, our panel, uh, Kim Lawrence from Ideon Technologies, which uh, has been a collaborator with BRIM for uh, for quite some time now, and we're very proud of the work that Ideon are doing in developing new solutions for exploration based on subatomic physics. 
So um, if you haven't heard of Ideon, please uh, you know, check out the website and see what they're doing. Again, like Oscar's technology, it's disruptive breakthrough technology and using, using um, taking totally new approaches to very important parts of the mining value chain. So introducing Kim. Um, so Ideon is a spin-off from the Triumph Particle Physics Lab at UBC, or located just outside UBC. If you haven't seen it, it's massive. Um, Ideon is a Vancouver-based subsurface intelligence company that uses the energy from supernova explosions in space to image in 3D down to one kilometre below the surface of the Earth. If it sounds like science fiction, it's no, it's, it's actually real. They, this is what they actually do. It's remarkable technology. Um, Kim has been with Ideon since the company began commercial activities in 2020. Her portfolio includes customer and employee experience, brand and culture, marketing and communications, government and uh, community engagement. Uh, and also facility operations because start, because it's a startup as well. So Kim does everything, I think, like everyone else does at Ideon as well. Um, so Kim, Kim has uh, had a variety of different positions uh, in a range of companies um, and has also had his, has experience as the uh, CMO at the University of Calgary. So, so welcome, Kim. What, what I want to do with this, this session is to, um, you know, one of the techniques that we use in strategy when we're looking at long-term futures is something called a pre-mortem. So pre-mortems are we're trying to imagine ourselves in the future and things haven't planned out the way that we thought they would. Um, so a pre-mortem asks, right, we were set ourselves this target, we didn't get there, what happened? That's a pre-mortem. So what it does is it gets over our optimism bias, it gets around some of the problems we have with uh, confirmation biases, all these psychological biases we have, and it's a really good technique for thinking about risk and challenges, uh, particularly um, a challenge of this nature like decarbonisation. So the scenario I'd like the panellists to think about is we're in 20, 2040, um, the mining industry has expanded significantly but it's under huge community pressure because it hasn't achieved its decarbonisation targets and it's really suffering from credibility loss and um, you know, social licence to operate because of that. So why? How do we get there? Imagine yourselves in this future. What, what are the, how do we not achieve these goals? What happened? So I might get an opinion from this scenario uh, from each of the panellists and maybe I'll start um, uh, Chi Ting. What uh, might start there? And I'll go to Kim Lawrence next. Well, I um, so for reference, John did give us a bit of a heads up, so this didn't come totally as new. But I'm not super prepared to to for this. But I, I think if I think about the presentation I did from that perspective, I think it's really we were not very thoughtful about the whole journey. We were quick, quick at uh, grabbing some of the shining project, uh, shining objects and not really being thoughtful about how and when and what we need to do to be aligned with our objective and, and therefore we execute poorly. Um, so when we were, when we realized that that may be a little bit too late. So that's, that's my one point on, on what uh, probably went wrong from my perspective. Thank you, Chiting. So really, it's that lack of a, we, you know, the, the, one of the risks to getting to net zero is having a true pathway and just being ad hoc about trying different things and not being strategic in our in how we roll out different technologies. It's a very interesting perspective. Jim, I might pass it over to you. If you're, you know, in this scenario, how do you think we got there? What are some of the challenges that we didn't overcome if we imagine this this future scenario, which isn't our, our, our preferred scenario. Yeah, you know, um, I think we're experiencing it right now. I, I kind of boil it down to the velocity imperative. And so um, I, I feel that if we're in that situation, we've probably collectively been too slow um, to test and adopt new tech. And Charles pointed some of that out as well. Like there's a lot of amazing um, technology on the market. The pace at which it is adopted, tested and deployed through operations at mine locations is slow. <laughs> and so we're experiencing that now. Um, and I think, um, 
you know, the, the reliance on comfortable traditional toolkits um, that continue to contribute to the challenge is part of that problem. If you look at, you know, it's 150 million meters of exploration drilling alone in a single year that's still on the books. Um, and, you know, that's something that we as company kind of directly impact the reduction of that, but yeah, because of velocity. Yeah, so a, gen a genuine lack of urgency. We think we can, we, we have time. Um, I think one of the things we're learning is that uh, 2030, 2040, you know, in mining lifetimes, these are this is the, the lifetime of many of our mines. So the mines that are operating now have to get to net zero. And I don't think we're used to thinking in terms of those time frames. So the point about just not enough urgency is really well taken. Yeah, just and just to add to that too, I think some of the larger organizations are, I want to say, hampered a little bit by the complexity of their own organizations and ownership of some of these things. And so, you know, you contrary to what I think people assume about the industry, I'm seeing an incredible amount of commitment, long-term thinking, and desire to make a difference. It's orchestrating all of the different groups who need to work together to make things happen practically that seems to be the challenge. I mean, contracting alone can take six months to a year to get a new tech, um, you know, into that queue. So, yeah, I think um, desire's there. Perhaps we're being hampered by our own organizations. Interesting perspective. Thank you. Um, Charles, um, maybe that's a, a good segue to you. I think, you know, imagine you're in this future. Um, what have you seen? What's happened? Why didn't we get there? Got you there. Thank you, John, for the question. Um, you know what? As I was trying to rub my crystal ball to see what kind of answer will come out of it, you know, I, I found it very difficult to, to blame my, the industry that I love so much. But I, I started pointing a finger at the world. And it's really saying that the world failed the mining industry in that it didn't embrace the value and importance of the mining industry quickly enough. And the world didn't invest enough in the mining industry, which was providing with all the benefits that the world is enjoying, like their cell phones, like the screens that they're watching this on. And, and I think really it's, it's a failure of the world to evolve into this new economy that really required us to, to not look at mining as an area where we should be competing against one another, but mining as a resource that the world needs to survive. You know, you saw during COVID how the entire planet kind of, you know, galvanized uh, energy around fixing the problem, right? But what you're not seeing happening right now globally, you're, you're seeing the mining people talking about solving the mining issues, but the world is kind of watching from a distance saying, well, you know, fix your problem. So I would say, let's point the finger at the world and say, hey, world, you failed the mining industry. We did the best that we could. Thank you, Charles. And I think um, yeah, one of the one of the is issues that um, is coming about pretty quickly is the the lack of access to capital. Um, you know, the the mining isn't seen as being an attractive area to invest, and without access to capital, it is very hard to make big changes to technologies as well. So again, um, you know, we, we can't look at the mining industry in isolation. It's part of a a bigger um, drive to net zero across the entire economy. So that's an interesting perspective as well. Ali, what, what do you think? We can imagine this, this future where we didn't make it and we, we didn't reach net zero. What do you, what do you think happened and, and you know, what, what, what therefore are the biggest risks for us? Yeah, so John, I think, uh... Similar to um, what Charles and, and Cheating were saying, I think it will be as a result of a failure or a misunderstanding uh, between the the society and the world as a whole and the industry. We can't look at mining industry and expect them to transition towards uh, a green economy at the same rate as, for example, transportation or car manufacturing can. They, the set of activities that we have in mining, the type of investment that we have, these are very low returns, but long term. And in the past, like 30 years or, few, uh, or 50 years, there are decisions that have been made that would basically result in a very kind of long term, but low interest uh, return. And if you cripple that mid midway through, uh, that investment, you're basically breaking that chain and, and therefore uh, basically you're, you're waiting for bankruptcy. The problem is, we, uh, I think if that happened, which I, uh, God forbid, I don't want to be um, 
a part of that, but I think it is because we as a whole society and maybe the decision makers in the industry fail to understand that if you want to meet your 2030 or your 2040 goals, you should start to differentiate the what I call low hanging fruit, the technologies that are mature and are less expensive to implement and try to meet that goal in the next five, six years, 10 years, which are only, like you said, a very short term kind of uh, f- uh, future for mining and then plan for a longer curve uh, by 2050. Um, I think the, let's not be cynical and look at future as like a Mad Max future. But <clears throat> if you want to achieve something in mining by 2030 or 2040, today is the day that you have to make that decision. Thank you, Ali. And that uh, theme of having a roadmap and a strategy rather than jumping from technology to technology uh, really seems to be important. And having a portfolio approach has seems to be something that's coming out as a theme. Um, Oscar, what do you think? What do you think of the... That, you know, if we imagine a future where we didn't make it, we didn't reach our net zero targets, what's happened? And, you know, what do you think are the, therefore the greatest risks to the industry to achieve these goals? Hmm. Um, God. If we didn't make it, John, um, there's going to be a lot of uh, finger pointing, but the, my perspective is is simple. That I mean, I agree with everything that has been said so far. Okay, so let me put it that way. Yes, you know, is the problem of you know of same stuff continuing with the inertia that we've been having. But in my perspective, the innovation, of course, you know, we need innovation in mining, but we need innovation in new business models for mining. Here we are with KPIs that we inherited or the mining people miners inherited from the industrial revolution to grow on the parameters of growth that are considered more and more and more that leads to consumption that leads to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For me, the savior is not really the technology that we're able to produce. Certainly we're gonna be one contributor of you know, uh, mitigating some of the larger effects. But so long as we continue with the same paradigms in how to make money, uh, especially in the mining industry, and the same param- paradigms that have been, as I said before, just passed on um, from God, you know, from 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 generations to generations of, of miners, because we continue with the same perspective. The KPIs are exactly the same. If you talk to the CEO of Rio, or you talk to a mine or a general manager in whatever mine Escondida say in Chile is exactly the same thing. They're going with this mindset of just producing more. Certainly there's some now ESG directives that are being put on top of uh, of mine, but the reality is those add on KPIs to their uh, dashboard. They are not significantly different from what they have to deliver. Therefore, that basically produces bureaucracy in adopting new technologies that therefore produces a little bit of slowdown in really going forward in mitigating environmental issues. So and, 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 and an innovation paradigm needs to be uh, redesigning the mining industry. Perhaps you know this could be done through governmental policy, new ESG policy that is now being enforced in a way that we haven't really seen before. I'm sorry, you know, I'm a little bit cynical because you know I've been talking to the right people and everybody tells me the same thing. Yes, you know, we need to decarbonize this, this, this is a path for this. But in reality, when I talk to the general managers of mines and the supervisors and the foreman, there's nothing at the ground level. The KPIs remain the same. Their work remains the same. We can't really change this, you know, just like this. Yeah. Sorry, you know, Yeah, <laughs> don't apologize. Like, we love and, the way we love the passion. We love the passion. I mean, that's 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 the part of a good a good panel debate. John, so, can I can I add uh, one point quickly? Please sir? do you please do you think? Yeah, so so maybe also just to that, and maybe I'm gonna put a little plug in for this organization called called Global Mining Group. So GMG, which we work, um, we, we, it's a volunteer driven group, and we work with mining operations, and and we are actually right now launching um, a series of workshops and guidelines on how do we operationalize decarbonization. Exactly to your point on, there is a gap 
on, you know, setting a target on the corporate level and being told that you need to implement, implement however the KPIs and things are not changing. So how do we really operationalize it? So we're, we're just launching a series of workshops. I'm leading the steering committee for that. Um, so certainly more work, important work to come to your point. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Chiting, and um, excellent uh, suggestion for a look at the resources from the Global Mining Guidelines Group. Uh, they've been doing excellent work for a long time. It's interesting to think about, you know, you know, we have these corporate aspirations, but how do we drive that through the organisation? Um, it, it, it is a shortcoming. I mean, uh, there's one company in Canada that has an internal carbon price. And so every business activity gets priced, has, an, has a price of carbon attached to it internally. So everyone knows you know, what's the real cost in terms of carbon carbon production. So and that and that that makes that makes a difference. It, it helps the it helps the company adapt faster. So there's things that we can do to adjust the just the KPIs. But maybe if I hand it over to the panel again, you know, having heard some of those discussions, those points about you know, why didn't we make it and these are the biggest risks, what would you recommend, you know, what do you think are the, the top of mind items that executives and managers should be thinking about with their pathway to net zero? Um, you know, is, is there a path to net zero and what does it look like based on some of the, some of the issues we raised in this scenario uh, of, uh, of not making it? So if you'd like, just, just come off mute if you have any position on you know what? What is what? Are, what are some of the top of mind priorities that that um, mining companies and technology companies should have? So maybe I can I can speak as a technology company, not a mining sure. company. Um, so as a technology company, uh, that is trans. Well, you know, the aspiration is to transform one particular process in the mining industry. Um, for us is not about the technology, it's about the adoption, the speed of adoption. We don't have time once again. Um, what we're trying to do is basically transform a process that took 30 to 50 years for the previous technology to get adopted. Now we are in a risk averse safety priority industry that we understand, we understand the how difficult it is you know, to adopt new technologies without literally disrupting processes and operations and internally. But somehow we need to create side paradigms that would allow for this adoption of technologies to happen faster. I know for a fact that here in Canada, we have NORCAD, for example, which is basically, um, from what I understand, is a mine that you know we technology developers, we can go and explore our technologies and, and play in a real world scenario. So paradigms like that, that allow to offset the risk for new technologies that is somehow sponsored. Remember, the key word here is acceleration and adoption, not what's the next big thing is acceleration and adoption. We don't have enough time. And I think that's the problem with, with that is, it doesn't really get conveyed very well. It's not decarbonization, it's decarbonization by 2030, so we can hit 2050 and net zero. You know what I mean? Sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm just yelling yeah. here at everyone. I'll, I'll, I'll stop, I'll stop. No, and that really speaks to Kim's point about the pace you know, we have to work at a, a different pace, and that means doing things differently as well. And thanks for calling out NORCAT, N-O-R-C-A-T. NORCAT is a fantastic, uh, you know, me mechanism for us to de-risk a lot of these technological innovations. Um, Kim, you had your hand up there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, and thanks for your passion, Oscar. I feel it very deeply myself. <laughs> Uh, and John, in, in one of the polls, of the final poll, you had an item in there that was specific to um, the imperative of having really good ore body knowledge. And so when I think about the entire mining industry and the billion dollar decisions that are made on a minuscule slice of geological knowledge, um, that is a fundamental issue that impacts the entire value chain, all the waste, all the emissions, everything that happens across the entire value chain. So 
if you start at the beginning and you understand with greater certainty what you've got um, beneath the surface to access, you can pinpoint laser target your efforts. You eliminate so much um, of the carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere. You lower drilling, you lower waste, you lower transportation of, of waste rock that you might not have needed to extract in the first place. So I think that focus on understanding ore body knowledge right up front um, will have a dramatic impact on outcomes. Thank you. And, and it also highlights that a lot of these decarbonisation agendas are also good for productivity as well. Yeah. <laughs> It's not like um, yeah, decarbonisation is going to impose a, a, a massive cost. A lot of them just are good things that we should be doing already, like like um, using all body knowledge better. Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, Chi Ting, I saw your hand up there. Uh, Charles has his hand up first. Maybe I'll let him go oh, first. Sorry, Charles. Yes, please go ahead first. Charles, we're going to hear you. You're in space, man. Sorry, I, I'm back back to Earth now. I uh, I uh, had a power failure at this end, so now I'm on my cell phone, hence the change in, in, in the loop and everything. Yeah, but answer the question is knowing the risks, what can we do now? So I think there's a couple of things that we can do. I think the first thing we need to do is recognize that this is not about technology, okay? The technology is already out there. Canada and the world has technology. And as Oscar said, it's about getting the technology adopted. And thanks for bringing up NOCAT. We need to test and demonstrate technologies, validate them quickly. It can be a five-year plan to validate technologies and then prove them out. Then the next thing we need to do is I think our government, especially the government of Canada and the governments around the world, need to invest in accelerating these solutions and moving them forward. We need to be more urgent in how we respond to, to, to these technologies that need the support to mature them and, and move them forward. And the last thing I want to say that to respond quickly enough, we need to collaborate more. We need to have a massive collaboration happening across the entire mining value chain so that we don't end up reinventing the wheel. Um, and maybe there was one more last thing to say, and I did say uh, the last thing in the previous statement, but one thing to say is that we, we can't just focus on the five biggest problems that, you know, that are the most obvious, right? This is about solving all the thousand problems that we have that need to be addressed by making sure that we decarbonize across the entire value chain and not just focusing on the, the things that are more sexy. Thank you, Charles. And I think that um, the, the shiny object problem is one that we all, you know, we, we, we go for the latest thing and we don't necessarily go through a strategic evaluation process of how we do things and what in what order. Um, Chi Ting, that was a point that you came up with as well. Yeah, thanks. And so I, I'm going to suggest a different point and thinking about what, what I'm hearing um, on all aspects of needing to do more. I, I think if we can have better climate literacy for the entire organization from all the way from the senior management to the operators, I think it will really help make a difference. I think as, as we heard earlier from Kim that people want to do the right thing. There's lots of desire. We're having some challenges with implementation, adoption, accelerating all that. And part of it, in my view, is, is um, because we perhaps not have the right literacy level so that we, we cling on to the shiny object that we can understand that may not be the best thing to do. Um, so, so perhaps finding ways to, to increase our knowledge in this space so that we can make better decisions and therefore accelerating those uh, activities would be really helpful. Thank you, Chi-Ting. I think we all, uh, all absolutely agree with that. Um, Ali, you have your hand up there. Yes, so uh, I, I, I agree with uh, everything that the panelists said. I think the urgency of meeting the goals uh, within the time is very important. If you miss the train, you're, you're going to be basically left um, in a very bad situation. I would like to say that we all have a role to play as, for example, academists and also uh, as, as, as researchers we are kind of uh, contributing to the development of technologies needed. We have to prioritize them, but I would also look, uh, like to mention that uh, there is a risk of, of not making it. And for mining industry, that's very, and the stakes are very high, you might lose your license to operate. And worse is uh, the climate change that is uh, uh, basically getting worse and worse would shut down your operations in 30 or 40 years. So I think um, that paradigm shift in 
planning and, and, and also uh, um, in long-term and short-term planning in mining uh, needs to uh, be brought in and people need to understand, like Cheating said, need to be uh, make themselves educated with regards to margin and abatement cost of, of uh, getting rid of carbon emissions and then making decisions on, on basically daily basis. The same way that we have these uh, touch base meetings every morning about what to do in an operation, we need to also have those maybe weekly on what to do about carbon in our operations. And I think um, we are able to adapt. It just needs to be uh, discussed and then planned. Thank you, Ali. And um, also open to questions at this point from the audience if you have any questions. But um, I, I think that that issue around um, you know, climate risk management for, for mining companies is one of those things that is it a whole whole is it's another webinar topic that we could do at a different time but um you know we know that a lot of the areas that we're going to rely on to produce copper are also going to be phenomenally challenged uh by water scarcity you know in the um in the andes and, and western south america so that's another issue for another time um i think one thing that's just just in in summing up i mean there's a few things that really have come out through the through the, the the discussion and through the panel that you know being being deliberate and being strategic about how we connect technology together in a in a complex system um, and also recognizing that every mine will have a different optimal route to, to net zero so for, this is very much a, a customized approach for different different organizations but having that whole of value chain approach, you know, from exploration right through to comminution, right through to closure and looking for decarbonisation op options across all of those steps. Uh, so a whole of value chain, whole of system approach will get us, you know, probably the, to the best pathway for, for mine decarbonisation, but it, it won't fit, won't be one size fits all. It's going to be uh, different mines taking different approaches. And I'll just check the chat to see if there's any any questions. Yeah, curious to hear the panelists' thoughts on the role of universities' research and teaching in mining and mineral exploration, and what relationships between industry and academics should look like and evolve too. Thank you, Lindsay Heggie. That's a very that's a very good question. Um, I might throw that open to the uh, to the panel. Um, what do you think about the roles of university research and teaching in in getting us to this? to this um, decarbonization um, um, pathway. Maybe John, I can jump on that. Yes, please. I think as, as, as a university and faculty members, we need to look at the skills our uh, future mining engineers need to have in their toolbox to address these issues. And for example, at UBC, we are changing our curriculum to include um, carbon literacy, should I say. I myself am teaching very heavily in my courses, the two courses about carbon emissions and, and also the overall energy carbon footprint. But um, um, also in the research side, um, like I said, it takes time to bring something from an R&D an lab to a mine site and get it approved with all the safety and measures that we have on a mine site. So if as, as a university, a researcher who is trying to contribute to this effort, a, par a portion of our activities is to offer the solutions that are a bit more mature to the industry for uptake, and then within the next five to 10 years, work in other technologies. So I think for mining and uh, industry to take something in tomorrow, that technology is already installed somewhere else and tested and, and, and um, basically is bulletproof. And the standards that the industry has are very high and the risks are very high too. So I, I hope that answers, but uh, there, there is a lot to, to cover in the future in terms of educating ourselves and the, the, the community of mining and, and public health uh, as well about, about carbon. I can give you the perspective from the industry, by the way, but I think, you know, cheating, you know, has. Uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, from from the uh, now that we're partnering with UBC and we have other four universities as partners, it's incredibly crucial. It's absolutely important you know, to actually have uh, new blood, new ideas, you know, being incubated, you know, in, in research. 
Problem is speed. Once again, acceleration. Universities, oh my God, they're just so slow, so slow. So uh, I propose, Ali, you know, so you can actually tell your overlords over there, a fast track for climate change related projects. We all understand that we are under pressure to develop new innovations. You understand that? Your students understand that, your postdocs, fantastic people. Your administrators, on the other hand, oh my dear Lord. Um, I will just put it like that, that's an idea. A fast track for climate change uh, projects, my God, that will facilitate a lot of you know, the conversations, you know, so move things faster. R literally, everybody's just like going in this race and you guys have a, a super big role to play, but playing with the rules that apply to any other project. I don't think that's going to go anywhere very fast. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Oscar. I might just go cheating and then, um, uh, Charles, we have another question, so I'll move on to the other question just to make sure we fit that in before we close off today. Uh, cheating. Yeah, I'll just, I, I agree with what's been said, but I want to add a different view. I think another role that the university and institutions are playing really critically is to get more young, intelligent people into the industry. So not so specifically in mining and, and engineering, but also broader around having the right people in the future of mining. So that's what I see the role of university. And I think there needs to be, in colleges and different institutions, I think there needs to be a better relationship with industry is supposed to help industry understand what kind of individuals could be useful for the future of mine, but also getting feedback from the industry around what are the what are the uh, characteristics and ad attributes of individuals that they 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 want to have. So having a, a better relationship, so we can uh, we can have a, a group of young people who are excited and can offer and have impact in mining in the future. Thank you, Cheating. We have a question from uh, from Bill Arling. Uh, Good day, Bill. And um, uh, Bill's a, a great collaborator and friend of Brim through uh, North Coal. Um, but um, Bill's question is, what about the role of regulators and regulations? And I think this is this is critical too. So um, just throw that one open to the panel. What what role can uh, can regulators play? Who would like to take that, Charles? I yeah, I, I, I think quickly what I'll say is, I think it's a well-known fact now that technology is advancing at a speed that is faster than the rate of regulation change. So I think, you know, regulators need to play a catch-up game. And I think regulators themselves need to innovate in mm. how they actually update and change regulations. There are regulations in the mining industry that that basically are keeping crippling the mining industry when it comes to things like ventilation mm -hmm. uh, for underground mines. And there's other regulations, you know, regulations around even how uh, new ore bodies get evaluated. You know, there's you can't even use new technologies when you're designing a new mine without it being proven, you know, a million times over. So, I think there are regulations that need to definitely be changed. But certainly, it's the speed of regulation change and keeping up with the times. Mm. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, innovation in regulation that's definitely definitely needed. Um, anyone else want to take this quick one? Uh, just we've got one minute left. Yeah, maybe I can I, I can um, take that. So I think regulations are very very important, and if they are um, properly set, they could be the driving force to push everybody in this panel and also elsewhere in the industry towards uh, a, a, a smooth transition. The most important leverage so so far has been a stick, being it carbon tax, but I think the carrot has to be properly regulated here as well. So, um, so far, the government is behind the curve, unfortunately, in ventilation, like Char said, most of our mine, underground mining uh, codes, if you look at them, if you electrify, you can't really reduce your uh, ventilation duty air because it's best based on shaft power. And there are examples of that as well. So we need better understanding of regulations and then fast transitioning of them to, to help us uh, climb the curve. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. And that brings us to the end of the uh, the webinar. I'd, I'd really like to thank the panellists for such a great discussion. Really pleased how that turned out and uh, also for the presentation. So I think we've covered a fairly complex topic in, in, a, in a good way and in a very short period of time. 
I'd like to thank uh, you all for, for coming along today and uh, we'll make this presentation available and uh, we'll have it up on YouTube and we'll be socialising that through our social networks. And finally, um, that's all from us and uh, we look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.